In searching for a point of departure, one turns naturally to a period in the history of Western thought when it was possible to believe that the thought of making freedom the sum and substance of philosophy has emancipated the human spirit in all its relationships, and has given to science in all its parts a more powerful reorientation than any earlier revolution. The word revolution bears multiple associations in this passage, for Schelling also proclaims that man is born to act and not to speculate, and when he writes that the time has come to proclaim to a nobler humanity the freedom of the spirit, and no longer to have patience with men's tearful regrets for their lost chains, we hear the echoes of the libertarian thought and revolutionary acts of the late eighteenth century. Schelling writes that the beginning and end of all philosophy is freedom. These words are invested with meaning and urgency at a time when men are struggling to cast off their chains, to resist authority that has lost its claim to legitimacy, to construct more humane and more democratic social institutions. It is at such a time that the philosopher may be driven to inquire into the nature of human freedom and its limits, and perhaps to conclude, with Schelling, that with respect to the human ego, its essence is freedom, and with respect to philosophy, the highest dignity of philosophy consists precisely therein, that it stakes all on human freedom. It is natural, then, that we should consider, abstractly, the problems of human freedom, and turn with interest and serious attention to the thinking of an earlier period, when archaic social institutions were subjected to critical analysis and sustained attack. It is natural and appropriate, so long as we bear in mind Schelling's admonition, that man is born not merely to speculate, but also to act. One of the earliest and most remarkable of the eighteenth-century investigations of freedom and servitude is Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality, 1755, in many ways a revolutionary tract. In it he seeks to set forth the origin and progress of inequality, the establishment and abuse of political societies, insofar as these things can be deduced from the nature of man by the light of reason alone. His conclusions were sufficiently shocking that the judges of the prize competition of the Academy of Dijon, to whom the work was originally submitted, refused to hear the manuscript through. In it, Rousseau challenges the legitimacy of virtually every social institution, as well as individual control of property and wealth. These are usurpations established only on a precarious and abusive right— having been acquired only by force, force could take them away without the rich having grounds for complaint. Not even property acquired by personal industry is held upon better titles. Against such a claim, one might object, do you not know that a multitude of your brethren die or suffer from need of what you have in excess, and that you needed express and unanimous consent of the human race to appropriate for yourself anything from common subsistence that exceeded your own? It is contrary to the law of nature that a handful of men be glutted with superfluities, while the starving multitude lacks necessities. Rousseau argues that civil society is hardly more than a conspiracy by the rich to guarantee their plunder. Hypocritically, the rich call upon their neighbors to institute regulations of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform, which make an exception of no one, and which compensate in some way for the caprices of fortune by equally subjecting the powerful and the weak to mutual duties, those laws which, as Anatole France was to say, in their majesty deny to the rich and the poor equally the right to sleep under the bridge at night. By such arguments the poor and weak were seduced. All ran to meet their chains, thinking they secured their freedom. Thus society and laws gave new fetters to the weak and new forces to the rich, destroyed natural freedom for all time, established forever the law of property and inequality, changed a clever usurpation into an irrevocable right, 
and for the profit of a few ambitious men, henceforth subjected the whole human race to work, servitude, and misery. Governments inevitably tend towards arbitrary power, as their corruption and extreme limit. This power is by its nature illegitimate, and new revolutions must dissolve the government altogether or bring it closer to its legitimate institution. The uprising that ends by strangling or dethroning a sultan is as lawful an act as those by which he disposed, the day before, of the lives and goods of his subjects. Force alone maintained him, force alone overthrows him. What is interesting in the present connection is the path that Rousseau follows to reach these conclusions by the light of reason alone, beginning with his ideas about the nature of man. He wants to see man as nature formed him. It is from the nature of man that the principles of natural right and the foundations of social existence must be deduced. This same study of original man, of his true needs, and of the principles underlying his duties, is also the only good means one could use to remove those crowds of difficulties which present themselves concerning the origin of moral inequality, the true foundation of the body politic, the reciprocal rights of its members, and a thousand similar questions as important as they are ill-explained. To determine the nature of man, Rousseau proceeds to compare man and animal. Man is intelligent, free, the sole animal endowed with reason. Animals are devoid of intellect and freedom. In every animal I see only an ingenious machine to which nature has given senses in order to revitalize itself and guarantee itself, to a certain point, from all that tends to destroy or upset it. I perceive precisely the same things in the human machine, with the difference that nature alone does everything in the operations of a beast, whereas man contributes to his operations by being a free agent. The former chooses or rejects by instinct, and the latter by an act of freedom, so that a beast cannot deviate from the rule that is prescribed to it even when it would be advantageous for it to do so, and a man deviates from it, often to his detriment. It is not so much understanding which constitutes the distinction of man among the animals as it is his being a free agent. Nature commands every animal, and the beast obeys. Man feels the same impetus, but he realizes that he is free to acquiesce or resist, and it is above all in the consciousness of this freedom that the spirituality of his soul is shown. For physics explains in some way the mechanism of the senses and the formation of ideas, but in the power of willing, or rather of choosing, and in the sentiment of this power, are found only purely spiritual acts about which the laws of mechanics explain nothing. Thus the essence of human nature is man's freedom and his consciousness of his freedom. So Rousseau can say that the jurists, who have gravely pronounced that the child of a slave would be born a slave, have decided in other terms that a man would not be born a man. Sophistic politicians and intellectuals search for ways to obscure the fact that the essential and defining property of man is his freedom. They attribute to men a natural inclination to servitude, without thinking that it is the same for freedom as for innocence and virtue. Their value is felt only as long as one enjoys them oneself, and the taste for them is lost as soon as one has lost them. The proof of his doctrine that the struggle for freedom is an essential human attribute, that the value of freedom is felt only as long as one enjoys it, Rousseau sees in the marvels done by all free peoples to guard themselves from oppression. True, those who have abandoned the life of a free man do nothing but boast incessantly of the peace and repose they enjoy in their chains. But when I see the others sacrifice pleasures, repose, wealth, power, and life itself for the preservation of this sole good which is so disdained by those who have lost it, 
when I see animals born free and despising captivity break their heads against the bars of their prison, when I see multitudes of entirely naked savages scorn European voluptuousness and endure hunger, fire, the sword, and death to preserve only their independence, I feel that it does not behoove slaves to reason about freedom. Rather similar thoughts were expressed by Kant forty years later. He cannot, he says, accept the proposition that certain people are not ripe for freedom, for example, the serfs of some landlord. If one accepts this assumption, freedom will never be achieved, for one cannot arrive at the maturity for freedom without having already acquired it. One must be free to learn how to make use of one's powers freely and usefully. The first attempts will surely be brutal and will lead to a state of affairs more painful and dangerous than the former condition under the dominance but also the protection of an external authority. However, one can achieve reason only through one's own experiences, and one must be free to be able to undertake them. To accept the principle that freedom is worthless for those under one's control, and that one has the right to refuse it to them forever, is an infringement on the rights of God Himself, who has created man to be free. The remark is particularly interesting because of its context. Kant was defending the French Revolution, during the terror, against those who claimed that it showed the masses to be unready for the privilege of freedom. Kant's remarks have contemporary relevance. No rational person will approve of violence and terror. In particular, the terror of the post-revolutionary state fallen into the hands of a grim autocracy, has more than once reached indescribable levels of savagery. Yet no person of understanding or humanity will too quickly condemn the violence that often occurs when long-subdued masses rise against their oppressors or take their first steps towards liberty and social reconstruction. To conclude these historical remarks, I would like to turn, as I have elsewhere, to Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the most stimulating and intriguing thinkers of the period. Humboldt was, on the one hand, one of the most profound theorists of general linguistics, and on the other, an early and forceful advocate of libertarian values. The basic concept of his philosophy is Bildung, by which, as J. W. Burrow expresses it, he meant the fullest, richest, and most harmonious development of the potentialities of the individual, the community, or the human race. His own thought might serve as an exemplary case. Though he does not, to my knowledge, explicitly relate his ideas about language to his libertarian social thought, there is quite clearly a common ground from which they develop, a concept of human nature that inspires each. Mill's essay On Liberty takes as its epigraph Humboldt's formulation of the leading principle of his thought, the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. Humboldt concludes his critique of the authoritarian state by saying, I have felt myself animated throughout with a sense of the deepest respect for the inherent dignity of human nature and for freedom which alone befits that dignity. Briefly put, his concept of human nature is this. The true end of man, or that which is prescribed by the eternal and immutable dictates of reason, and not suggested by vague and transient desires, is the highest and most harmonious development of his powers to a complete and consistent whole. Freedom is the first and indispensable condition which the possibility of such a development presupposes, but there is besides another essential, intimately connected with freedom, it is true, a variety of situations. Like Rousseau and Kant, he holds that nothing promotes this ripeness for freedom so much as freedom itself. This truth, perhaps, may not be acknowledged by those who have so often used this unripeness as an excuse for continuing repression. 
but it seems to me to follow unquestionably from the very nature of man. The incapacity for freedom can only arise from a want of moral and intellectual power. To heighten this power is the only way to supply this want, but to do this presupposes the exercise of the power, and this exercise presupposes the freedom which awakens spontaneous activity. Only it is clear we cannot call it giving freedom, when bonds are relaxed which are not felt as such by him who wears them. But of no man on earth, however neglected by nature and however degraded by circumstances, is this true of all the bonds which oppress him. Let us undo them one by one, as the feeling of freedom awakens in men's hearts, and we shall hasten progress at every step. Those who do not comprehend this may justly be suspected of misunderstanding human nature and of wishing to make men into machines. Man is fundamentally a creative, searching, self-perfecting being. To inquire and to create, these are the centers around which all human pursuits more or less directly revolve. But freedom of thought and enlightenment are not only for the elite. Once again, echoing Rousseau, Humboldt states, There is something degrading to human nature in the idea of refusing to any man the right to be a man. He is, then, optimistic about the effects on all of the diffusion of scientific knowledge by freedom and enlightenment. But all moral culture springs solely and immediately from the inner life of the soul and can only be stimulated in human nature and never produced by external and artificial contrivances. The cultivation of the understanding, as of any of man's other faculties, is generally achieved by his own activity, his own ingenuity, or his own methods of using the discoveries of others. Education, then, must provide the opportunities for self-fulfillment. It can, at best, provide a rich and challenging environment for the individual to explore in his own way. Even a language cannot, strictly speaking, be taught, but only awakened in the mind. One can only provide the thread along which it will develop of itself. I think that Humboldt would have found congenial much of Dewey's thinking about education, and he might also have appreciated the recent revolutionary extension of such ideas, for example, by the radical Catholics of Latin America who are concerned with the awakening of consciousness, referring to the transformation of the passive, exploited lower classes into conscious and critical masters of their own destinies. He would, I am sure, have approved of their criticism of schools that are more preoccupied with the transmission of knowledge than with the creation, among other values, of a critical spirit. From the social point of view, the educational systems are oriented to maintaining the existing social and economic structures instead of transforming them. But Humboldt's concern for spontaneity goes well beyond educational practice in the narrow sense. It touches also the question of labor and exploitation. The remarks just quoted about the cultivation of understanding through spontaneous action continue as follows. Man never regards what he possesses as so much his own as what he does, and the laborer who tends a garden is perhaps in a truer sense its owner than the listless voluptuary who enjoys its fruits. In view of this consideration, it seems as if all peasants and craftsmen might be elevated into artists, that is, men who love their labor for its own sake, improve it by their own plastic genius and inventive skill, and thereby cultivate their intellect, ennoble their character, and exalt and refine their pleasures. And so humanity would be ennobled by the very things which now, though beautiful in themselves, so often serve to degrade it. But still, freedom is undoubtedly the indispensable condition, without which even the pursuits most congenial to individual human nature can never succeed in producing such salutary influences. Whatever does not spring from a man's free choice, 
or is only the result of instruction and guidance, does not enter into his very being, but remains alien to his true nature. He does not perform it with truly human energies, but merely with mechanical exactness. If a man acts in a purely mechanical way, reacting to external demands or instruction rather than in ways determined by his own interests and energies and power, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is. On such conceptions, Humboldt grounds his ideas concerning the role of the state, which tends to make man an instrument to serve its arbitrary ends, overlooking his individual purposes. His doctrine is classical liberal, strongly opposed to all but the most minimal forms of state intervention in personal or social life. Writing in the 1790s, Humboldt had no conception of the forms that industrial capitalism would take. Hence, he is not overly concerned with the dangers of private power. But when we reflect, still keeping theory distinct from practice, that the influence of a private person is liable to diminution and decay, from competition, dissipation of fortune, even death, and that clearly none of these contingencies can be applied to the state, we are still left with a principle that the latter is not to meddle in anything which does not refer exclusively to security. He speaks of the essential equality of the condition of private citizens, and of course has no idea of the ways in which the notion private person would come to be reinterpreted in the era of corporate capitalism. He did not foresee that democracy, with its motto of equality of all citizens before the law, and liberalism, with its right of man over his own person, both would be wrecked on realities of capitalist economy. He did not foresee that in a predatory capitalist economy, state intervention would be an absolute necessity to preserve human existence and to prevent the destruction of the physical environment. I speak optimistically. As Karl Polanyi, for one, has pointed out, the self-adjusting market could not exist for any length of time without annihilating the human and natural substance of society. It would have physically destroyed man and transformed his surroundings into a wilderness. Humboldt did not foresee the consequences of the commodity character of labor. The doctrine, in Polanyi's words, that it is not for the commodity to decide where it should be offered for sale, to what purpose it should be used, at what price it should be allowed to change hands, and in what manner it should be consumed or destroyed. But the commodity in this case is a human life, and social protection was therefore a minimal necessity to constrain the irrational and destructive workings of the classical free market. Nor did Humboldt understand that capitalist economic relations perpetuated a form of bondage which, as early as 1767, Simon Languet had declared to be even worse than slavery. It is the impossibility of living by any other means that compels our farm laborers to till the soil whose fruits they will not eat, and our masons to construct buildings in which they will not live. It is want that drags them to those markets where they await masters who will do them the kindness of buying them. It is want that compels them to go down on their knees to the rich man in order to get from him permission to enrich him. What effective gain has the suppression of slavery brought him? He is free, you say. Ah, that is his misfortune. The slave was precious to his master because of the money he had cost him. But the handicraftsman costs nothing to the rich voluptuary who employs him. These men, it is said, have no master. They have one, and the most terrible, the most imperious of masters. That is need. It is this that reduces them to the most cruel dependence. If there is something degrading to human nature in the idea of bondage, then a new emancipation must be awaited, Fourier's third and last emancipatory phase of history which will transform the proletariat to free men by eliminating the commodity character of labor, ending wage slavery, 
and bringing the commercial, industrial, and financial institutions under democratic control. Perhaps Humboldt might have accepted these conclusions. He does agree that state intervention in social life is legitimate if freedom would destroy the very conditions without which not only freedom but even existence itself would be inconceivable, precisely the circumstances that arise in an unconstrained capitalist economy. In any event, his criticism of bureaucracy and the autocratic state stands as an eloquent forewarning of some of the most dismal aspects of modern history, and the basis of his critique is applicable to a broader range of coercive institutions than he imagined. Though expressing a classical liberal doctrine, Humboldt is no primitive individualist in the style of Rousseau. Rousseau extols the savage who lives within himself. He has little use for the sociable man, always outside of himself, who knows how to live only in the opinion of others, from whose judgment alone he draws the sentiment of his own existence. Humboldt's vision is quite different. The whole tenor of the ideas and arguments unfolded in this essay might fairly be reduced to this, that while they would break all fetters in human society, they would attempt to find as many new social bonds as possible. The isolated man is no more able to develop than the one who is fettered. Thus he looks forward to a community of free association without coercion by the state or other authoritarian institutions, in which free men can create and inquire and achieve the highest development of their powers, far ahead of his time he presents an anarchist vision that is appropriate, perhaps, to the next stage of industrial society. We can perhaps look forward to a day when these various strands will be brought together within the framework of libertarian socialism, a social form that barely exists today, though its elements can be perceived I have discussed these traditional ideas at some length, not out of antiquarian interest, but because I think that they are valuable and essentially correct, and that they project a course we can follow with profit. Social action must be animated by a vision of a future society, and by explicit judgments of value concerning the character of this future society. These judgments must derive from some concept of the nature of man, and one may seek empirical foundations by investigating man's nature, as it is revealed by his behavior and his creations, material, intellectual, and social. We have perhaps reached a point in history when it is possible to think seriously about a society in which freely constituted social bonds replace the fetters of autocratic institutions, rather in the sense conveyed by the remarks of Humboldt that I quoted, and elaborated more fully in the tradition of libertarian socialism in the years that followed. Predatory capitalism created a complex industrial system and an advanced technology. It permitted a considerable extension of democratic practice and fostered certain liberal values, but within limits that are now being pressed and must be overcome. It is not a fit system for the mid-twentieth century. It is incapable of meeting human needs that can be expressed only in collective terms, and its concept of competitive man, who seeks only to maximize wealth and power, who subjects himself to market relationships, to exploitation and external authority, is anti-human and intolerable in the deepest sense. An autocratic state is no acceptable substitute, nor can the militarized state capitalism evolving in the United States, or the bureaucratized, centralized welfare state, be accepted as the goal of human existence. The only justification for repressive institutions is material and cultural deficit. But such institutions, at certain stages of history, perpetuate and produce such a deficit, and even threaten human survival. Modern science and technology can relieve men of the necessity for specialized, imbecile labor. They may, in principle, provide the basis for a rational social order
based on free association and democratic control, if we have the will to create it. A vision of a future social order is in turn based on a concept of human nature. If, in fact, man is an indefinitely malleable, completely plastic being, with no innate structures of mind and no intrinsic needs of a cultural or social character, then he is a fit subject for the shaping of behavior by the state authority, the corporate manager, the technocrat, or the central committee. Those with some confidence in the human species will hope this is not so, and will try to determine the intrinsic human characteristics that provide the framework for intellectual development, the growth of moral consciousness, cultural achievement, and participation in a free community. In a partly analogous way, a classical tradition spoke of artistic genius acting within and in some ways challenging a framework of rule. Conceivably, we might in this way develop a social science based on empirically well-founded propositions concerning human nature. We might also try to study the forms of artistic expression, or for that matter, scientific knowledge that humans can conceive, and perhaps even the range of ethical systems and social structures in which humans can live and function, given their intrinsic capacities and needs. Perhaps one might go on to project a concept of social organization that would, under given conditions of material and spiritual culture, best encourage and accommodate the fundamental human need, if such it is, for spontaneous initiative, creative work, solidarity, pursuit of social justice. It must, needless to say, be stressed that social action cannot await a firmly established theory of man and society, nor can the validity of the latter be determined by our hopes and moral judgments. The two, speculation and action, must progress as best they can, looking forward to the day when theoretical inquiry will provide a firm guide to the unending, often grim, but never hopeless struggle for freedom and social justice.